Um, good afternoon, sir. And madam. Um, today I will introduce, I and our team member will introduce some um, virtualization optimization on KVM on Huawei's public cloud. Yeah, um, our virtualization uh, optimization consists, uh, consists of several points. Um, the first point is that uh, GPU P2P, P2P virtualization optimization. Um, the GPU instance in Huawei's uh, public cloud, um, some, in some port, especially for the HPC and the AI cloud. So, um, basically, there are two technology ways of GPU virtualization. One is vGPUs, mostly used at the graphics scenario. For example, the uh, uh, virtualization desktop, such kind of things. And the other direction is to GPU computing. Um, for GPU computing, uh, for HPC AI cloud, the vGPU is a lot necessary because the workload for each GPU is very high. So we, we, have, we don't need to separate the GPUs into different, different vGPUs. So uh, under this situation, uh, we use GPU pass-through. But um, GPU pass-through itself is quite straightforward and simple. But um, for HPC and AI, the GPU direct pass-through is not enough. Um, there are two standards for GPU used in AI. Uh, one is GPU computing cap capability. The second is GPU communication capability. The GPU com computing capability, usually we directly pass through the GPUs to each VMs and then it, that's okay. But for GPU communication capability, it's a big problem for us. Um, we use NVIDIA P100 GPUs in some of our um, GPU instance. The NVIDIA works well. NVIDIA P100 works well under native, but under the virtualization, we meet big, big problem. For example, um, in, normal, in normal ways, we direct pass through the GPU to the guest, to the VMs. The bandwidth is only um, about 40% of the native performance. And the latency is um, about 180% per percent of native. So the bandwidth drop, drop very big, and the latency grows very, very, very big. OK. This topology is the GPU P2P communication topology. Uh, generally, there are three ways for GPU communicate with another GPU. Uh, sorry, I, I will say that why GPU communication is important for the AIs? Because, the, for example, the AIs uh, consist of different uh, uh, layers. The layer one had the computing and then transfer the data to layer two, and layer two the transfer to layer three. So, under AI situations, the GPU communication capability is very, very important, especially for AI, for example, the coffee and other AI algorithm. So this is the topology of uh, the GPU P2P communication. Generally, there are three ways. The shortest way is that, the, for example, the, the red line from GPU, one, uh, GPU 0 to GPU 1, the data path is that the GPU, GPU 0 send the transfer date to the PCI switch, then directly downstairs to another GPUs. The middle long pass is that the, the, the blue line. The blue line is that the date transfer from GPU, then to PCI switch, then to the root complex, root complex, and then go down. The longest way is that the GPU date need to go upstairs to the CPU one and then through the QPR or UPI to another CPUs and then go downstairs to another GPUs. So um, for NVIDIA native, they usually use the pass one. 
that means that the shortest one. But under the, under the uh, virtualization, we meet a big problem. Because, you know, uh, for example, the other, other virtualization environment, um, the date cannot directly go through from the GPU zero to the PCI switch, then go down to the GPU one, because the GPA is usually need to translate by IOMU. That means that it should go to go through the GPU switch, then upstairs to the root root complex, and then translate it by the IOMUs, then go down. Um, some technology can really release this um, problem. Uh, for example, PCI. Uh, ATS, but unfortunately, the GPU of NVIDIA don't support ATS, so each transaction needs to go upstairs to the IOMU, then translate it, and then go down. So that's the problem. So uh, you know, our optimization, uh, we solve two problems. One problem is a performance issue, and another problem is a security issue. For performance, for example, um, we fake the bar, we use the, we fake the bar. Because each GPU is in native, the resource di didn't conflict. So we can directly use the bar of native as the virtualization bar, as the VM bar. So we call it a fake bar. In that way, the GPA equal to the HPA. So we don't need to translate, we don't need to translate by IMM use. Um, the fake bar is the step one. Step two is that we need to control the date. Don't let it go, go upstairs to the road complex to translate. So we used PCIe ACS to control the date. And then let the date just go to the PCI switch then go downstairs, uh, uh, downstreams to the GPUs. So in this way, no uh, IOMMU for GPU to GPU communication. Um, in, this, in this way, the performance is exactly the latent performance. Uh, the bandwidth and the latency is exactly as good as latent. But in this solution, there comes, from, there comes the security issue. Security issue means that um, if we don't prevent malicious access from GPU one to GPU X, that means the GPU of one VMs can steal the date of other VMs. So we need to prevent a security issue. Um, most of the cloud provider, uh, they, don't agree, uh, they don't support this because for, um, they usually allocate all the GPUs on the one PCI switch, for example, maybe four GPUs to just one VMs. They cannot separate them into two, into two and two and then assign two get VMs because they, they cannot prevent the security issue. But you know that the GPU instance is very, very expensive. If the finest, the smallest, you need, we need to we, we assign to a guest is four or eight. That means the customers should pay a lot of money to, to Huawei to, uh, to have the instance. But the AI corporation, they spend a long time to train their model. In this stage, in this stage, they don't need many, many GPUs. They only need, for example, two GPUs is okay. So they can so the, uh, it's a requirement from a customer that we can separate the GPU numbers to the VMs. So we, if we, secure, we, we solve the security issue, then we can um, separate different numbers GPUs to different VMs. Uh, the, ways to, the ways to solve the security issue is uh, we use the uh, PCIe egress. PCIe egress can control that um, one port, one port, control one port, the data flow of one port to some port it allowed. So if this port belong to one VMs, we allow it the data from port one to port two. But if this port, if these two ports are not belong to one VMs, 
we don't, we don't, we don't allow this uh, access. In this way, we separate the different GPUs groups to different VMs. Okay. After, after the optimization, um, uh, we have some data about uh, our results. The right side is the native, and the left side is our uh, VM GPUs. From this data, we, we, we see that the performance of GPU in our VMs is exactly as good as biometer. Um, that's our uh, GPU virtualization optimization. And uh, next uh, three op optimization will be talked by, uh, by my co colleague, Gong Lei. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, let's talk about the next uh, agenda. Uh, the first one is optimization for log holder preemption. Maybe uh, many people here maybe know about the local holder preemption. It is very obvious in virtualization environment because of the VCPU scheduling and the task preemption. And the local holder preemption issue may be bring some side effects. For example, it potentially blocks the process of other VCPUs waiting to acquire the same block same block, and increasing synchronization latency, and eventually suffer the performance degradation. So how to elevate the log holder preemption issue? We list four solutions to elevate the log holder preemption. The first one is pause loop exiting, and the second one is delay log holder scheduling named by our servers. And the third one is called scheduling. The last one is balance scheduling. So let's talk about some details about its solution. The first one, pause loop exiting. It is many uh, hardware, uh, hardware existed uh, virtualization te uh, technology, you know. And it requires some hardware uh, support, some like, uh, something like a VMCS configuration. And it is an optimization for lock waiters to active VM exiting and avoid the waste VCPU cycles for invalid spin. So the process is the PoE is supported well by upstream, just like Zen hypervisor and the KVM. But the cost is setting appropriate values of PoE gap and the PoE window are difficult. And they are usually need to be adjusted according to different workload. Uh, it is also different to find an uh, appropriate VCPU to yield. OK, the delay log hold scheduling is realized by ourselves before I describe the DLHS, I'd like to introduce some background. Usually, the log holders are on the interrupted disable contests, and normally, the period of holding lock is shortly. We need to choose some hard, hardware support, just like the in, interrupt window exiting function of Intel VDX, and uh, we need to in the HR timer. So firstly, we set a grace period, period for log holder with CPU before it is be scheduled. And if one with CPU is the log holder, we start one extra timer and whose expired time is a grace period. And then we set the interrupt window exiting for the with CPU. And there is two cases. The first one is the extra timer expire before the vCPU release lock. And the second one is the extra timer expire after the vCPU release lock. 
So for the first one, we just need to clear the interrupt window and continue to schedule the vCPU. But for the second case, we need to have solutions to judge the vCPU release the lock. Something like PoE happened or the interrupt window exiting happened. Then we need to cancel the extra timer and release the grace period. Then schedule the vCPU immediately. OK, let's see the performance. We use the hackbench test the VM performance in the guests. And the CPU over commit rate, sorry, it's uh, one, two, three. 16 P CPUs to 48 vCPUs in three VMs. And the, the result lower is better. You know. The top three lines are the results of non-patched virtual machines. But the below three lines is the result of patched virtual machines. OK, the next is the balance scheduling. Before uh, introducing the balance scheduling, I need to also introduce the cost scheduling and the balance scheduling. We can see in the left, of it, left uh, diagram, it is the cost scheduling semantic diagram. It requires the host to have enough either PCPUs to run or VCPUs at the same time. And, and in the right side is the balance scheduling scheme, um, schematic diagram. It disappears all, PC, all VCPUs to different PCPUs as much as possible. So about cost gathering, maybe cause two problems, CPU fragmentation and the priority inversion. CPU fragmentation may reduce CPU realization and the delay with CPU execution. And we can see from the below figure, vCPU 0 and vCPU 1 can't be scheduled until T1 because there is only one idle CPU, idle PCPU at T0. And the priority inversion is where a higher priority task is scheduled after lower priority task. For example, an IO bound job is giving a priority to run whenever it is ready. However, it cannot run because all PCPUs are allocated to the core schedule taskers. So the priority inversion problem may adversely affect interactive or IO bound jobs and on the utilize other resources such as discs. We can also see the figure. The IO bound job, it is ready between T0 to T1, but it can't be runnable because at T1, because the scheduler assigns the PCPU 0 and the PCPU 1 on vCPU 0 and vCPU 1. So, the IO bound job can run can runnable until T2. So the longer the, uh, the time slice of VCPU 1, T2 subtract T1, the longer the IO bound job's latency. Okay, let's see the balance gathering. Balance scheduling is used to balance vCPU severance on different PCPUs. And it is without precisely scheduling the vCPUs simultaneously. So how to do that? We use a bitmap to record all the PCPUs for one virtual machine. 
And then we modified the uh, Linux kernel scheduler. Just like a set bit when one vCPU enqueued and the clear the bit if we decode the vCPU task. And also we need to check the bitmap in migration, find the idle CPU, select task RQ, etc. Of course, if the scheduler can't find a proper, uh, appropriate PCPU according to used bitmap, no longer consider the bitmap requirement, but the original affinity requirement. So it's not forced to require the used bitmap. Let's see the performance evaluation. We used the push server workload in Huawei private, uh, private cloud. And we tested continuous te for 24 hours. And the result shows before optimization, 70% of building time less than 10 minute seconds and with balanced scheduling optimization, 93.5% of building train time less than 10 milliseconds. With one-to-one -one VCPU pin, there are 95.3% of building train time less than 10 milliseconds. And the result shows the balanced scheduling, the factors of balanced scheduling is near to the VCPU pin. Okay, the last uh, topic is RTC optimization on KVM. RTC is used very common on Windows guests as the clock source, uh, clock event device. RTC emulation in QMU on KVM. And there are three timers in the QMU, the current uh, realization had some pain points because some operations need to hold the bigger QMU rock and uh, lots of contestants switching between user space and the kernel space and we need to inject the interrupters from the user space. Finally, we will suffer performance degradation, something like that latency increase and the Windows guest density decrease. Okay, let's see the RTC optimization on KVM. We minimize influence, uh, influence of big QMU rock. We placing RTC memory region outside the big QMU rock. And using IRQFD inject interrupters. Also, we, need, uh, we use lots of hyperwave features, just like hyperwave clock and uh, some other hyperwave features to decrease, decrease the iPod access on uh, 70 zero, uh, seven, uh, IO port 70 and 71. Also, we think to move RTC emulation to hypervisor. And uh, also, I uh, um, discussed this idea with Polo. And Polo said this uh, uh, optimization has a big surface, attack uh, surface. It is compatible with new features such as a split IQ chip. Finally, we used a, a new RTC compensation solution. Uh, the RTC comp uh, compensation solution is a solution RTC takes in hypervisor di uh, directory. We need to count the consistent coalesced interrupters. When the RTC interrupt injecting failed, we need to count the interrupters and adjust the count when RTC injector rate changing. Also, we inject the coalesced interrupters after your UI handler if it exists. So we don't need a separate timer to do that. And it's more timely. Of course, we need to throttle the speed if there is too many coalesced interrupters because the windows may be uh, crash. Finally, we also think about the live migration support. So we need to save in the coalesced interrupters in source side and restore them in the dest destination side. Both KVM and QMU need to be patched. Okay, 
let's finally let's see the optimization evalu uh, evaluation. We used the benchmark as logging VSI. Logging VSI was designed to perform benchmarks for VDI workloads through system saturation. We can uh, you, we can Google it, the login VSI if you don't. Let's see the results. The above figure is the result before optimization. The VSI max is sixty eight, and the the below figure is the after is the result after optimization and the. VSI result is 78%, and we finally increased 10 virtual machines. So the effect is very obviously. So thank you. Any questions? Hello. Okay. This, is a, this is a great tour of uh, optimizations and performance problems. Uh, one, one question: Do you think, do you think um, core scheduling is going to be? Uh, what are your thoughts on core scheduling uh, in relation to uh, L1TF and hyperthreading? L1TF, you mean? Yes. Okay, L1TF is usually because of the uh, ha hyper threat of vCPU feature, you know. And if the core scheduling can be, can be used with that uh, scenario, maybe it is useful. But uh, this core scheduling can't um, require the, VCPU, the PCPUs are at the same core but maybe the core scheduling is not that core scheduling. I mean. I, th I think, I, think I, yeah, I get what you're saying. Strict core scheduling for the whole VM isn't necessary, but just that the, the hyper-thread pair kind yeah. of basis, yeah. I mean, I reckon all the public clouds, you know, everyone didn't turn off hyper-threading, so what are they doing? I, went, I wonder, and there, there's the Amazon, that patch set that's gone upstream. I was just wondering if you had comments on the, the, your perspective on the future of, of co-scheduling and, and uh, whether or not that's going to be the, the way to do safe hyper-threading for virtual machines. I mean, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, usually for our wild cloud computing, we usually assign two threads of core to the same guest OS. Uh, to avoid the, the, the performance bumping. So um, the information clue in the S3 cache belongs to one of the VMs, so no problem. Yeah. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Thank you.